Um, you listen to season two, episode two of the Are You Listening podcast with Geo Baker and Austin Johnson. Welcome to this episode of the Are You Listening podcast. Geo, Turkey Day is over, man. How was your Thanksgiving break? Man, it was solid. I'm uh, I'm up in northern New Hampshire right now. Uh, enjoy some time with my girlfriend and her family. So it was the first time, uh, like with the extended fam with with her. So that was a uh, uh, fun. I mean, it was fun, but you know, obviously a little bit nervous too. You know, being around the whole family. So that, but it was a good time. How about you, bro? First holiday with the meeting meeting the family. Yeah, first holiday meeting the family, bro. So How was, was it? Like, you know, you I know. Need the recap. It. I need the I need the. The, the film report. I mean, it was cool. It was good. Yeah. I mean, the, the food was good, and, and like, and, and they're all they're all good people. So it was it was it was it was easy, man. I was definitely a little nervous, but I shouldn't have been. It was it was fine. It's cold as hell up there already. Yeah, it's cold, bro. It's cold. I mean, like, I'm <laughs> bro, I'm from Southern New Hampshire. Like, I was just saying, there's no difference like, between Northern and Southern no, New Hampshire. It's all no, cold, bro. A, there is a huge no, not in terms of the weather, but like, it's just like I'm in the middle of nowhere right now. Really. <laughs> like people from southern new hampshire don't even like there's like a certain exit where you know you don't go past it like and i'm i'm way past it right now so this this is different my boy north of the wall for all the game of thrones fans yeah, out there no, literally like, literally, like we, <laughs> we the north for real that's dope man i'm happy to hear that you had a, a good time and an extended break yeah it's always nice thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays because obviously the food is a one, but just being able to see family and friends and all the expectations of Christmas with the gift given, it can get kind of stressful. So, yeah, um, speaking of breaks, it. man, speaking of breaks, are you had a, a long extended one? They did, pause, and then they had the opportunity to, I think, get healthy um, after that Georgetown win. Have you ever had how many? I don't even know how many days consecutive. No. I think it was seven or eight, bro. Maybe I was, even more. I was thinking about that, like. We've never done that. Like we've never done that for for Thanksgiving break before when I was there. So I, I, I'm sure the guys really appreciated it. I'm sure the coaches appreciated it. Like guys being able to you know go home, uh, see their family just for a quick second before coming back and, and locking back in. So I think uh, I think it was really cool they were able to do that. But we've never done that before in the past from from what I remember. Yeah, there's a lot of tournaments going on national uh, nationwide um, feast week all the people down in the islands and in Hawaii, things of that nature. So there's basketball to be played, but it's strategic, especially for a team that's on the mend and expecting Mawat Mag uh, back and other players as well. Um, so, you know, looking in retrospect at the end of the season, it could be exactly what the doctor ordered, so to speak, um, yeah, for man. this team to get healthy and be full strength going into Big Ten play. Yeah, I think the more the more time they can kind of just buy, especially for, you know, guys like Mawat and, and Emmanuel, I mean, it's only going to help him in the long run. And, and also, it's giving us some time to continue to gel on the practice court. I mean, I think we, we, we've we seen steady improvement each game, which has been the coolest part about, about it so far. It has been. A team that's definitely the sum of its parts. And not a definitive star player from a scoring standpoint as of yeah. yet has taken yeah. on that um, responsibility. But I think that that could be a very unique uh, advantage that they have going ahead. Uh, really hard to game plan for them. And um, last time we had a chance to uh, get on here and chop it up, we discussed how they were able to uh, effectively defeat Georgetown, had a little bit of a break, and now um, St. Peter's rolls into town. And Jersey basketball, uh, just all in all, it doesn't matter the level. If it's a high-level, mid-major, low-major, people are competitive, man. They got that Jersey toughness or they're recruiting guys from New York City or the surrounding areas. And when you come into Rutgers or Seton Hall, one of the high majors, you got something to prove. So Seton right. Hall, uh, the Peacocks played uh, – no, my apologies, St. Peter's played Seton Hall very, very tough earlier on in this season. Um, so I was expecting for this to be a real grinded out game. Um, yeah. Have you ever competed against uh, St. Peter's at all? I don't think I ever played against St. Peter's, but I do know that Coach Pico will always say whenever, whenever it was a Jersey school coming in or if it was – a Jersey player playing for like a, a low major, mid major coming in. He always said that they all believe they should be at Rutgers. Like, and he would basically say like, this is their tournament game. This is where, you know, they get to prove that, that they belong on the big stage, you know? So it was exactly what you were just saying is like, they are all coming in with a chip on their shoulder. Like I belong here. I should be at Rutgers, not you. 
know what I'm saying? Like, so it's and, and they get to play freely because no one's really expecting them to win that game. So that was one thing I always remember, like we'd always be a little bit more nervous about the Jersey schools or like if a guy was from Jersey and Pike, Pike would over, always like over exaggerated too. like, oh, he bought he has 30 tickets. He's asking for 30 tickets. We're calling him. We got no more tickets left. He's bringing his family. He's bringing his aunts, uncles, like his cousins. Like, he always over And they never did. They never had a full party there. But he always over exaggerated how many people they were having to come to that, the game. That uh, locker room billboard material to yeah, get guys exactly. up. Yeah, exactly. So he was always trying to find a reason to, to uh, you know, hype it up even more, too. So That's so that, hilarious. That, that, always, that always scared me a little bit. The coaches go to extreme lengths to get their guys not only prepared physically, but mentally, that's the most important part. So yeah. you've heard it all if you've been in the locker room at, at some level. Uh, but yeah, to your point, 13 scholarship guys for St. Peter's, eight of which happen to be from either New Jersey or New York. So exactly. yeah, exactly. coming into this game, they wanted it. But RU did a really good job. And, and the profile is one of which they take on the identity of their head coach in St. Peter's, Bashir Mason, who came over from Wagner, Jersey City guy himself. Um, and they originate around toughness. They rebound 47.2% of their misses, which coming into the game yesterday ranked second in the country. And that's crazy when you look at their starting lineup. There's nobody out there that you would say is is crazy tall or extremely yeah. physical in, in stature. So that just shows you that guys are rushing to the rim whenever the, the shot go up with reckless abandonment. Yeah, man, I mean – I mean, those guys, they really attack the glass, and, and that's something that Rutgers is going to have to think about moving forward, too. I mean, they 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 obviously played great. They won the game, but they lost the battle on the glass, and that's something that, I mean, we're looking ahead in the schedule. They got Illinois coming in. I mean, those guys, they got some dudes, Wake Forest, you know, so they, the, the schedule is going to start to ramp up, and I think it's it's good that they won the game, but they still get some good film out of it. That's, that's the, the biggest thing to me, and Coach Pike was definitely going to make sure to key in on that because – in the Big Ten, if you don't rebound, it's going to be long, long nights. Yeah, it's going to have to be a collective effort. Uh, despite the rebound it being the one glaring, um, you know, uh, statistic that could be improved, the team played well, um, yeah. forcing 23 turnovers, uh, which is insane at yeah. the Division One level, and only committing seven. Nowhere Fernandes, um, I think, really was an excellent spark for them on both sides of the court. Um, he finished the game with 19 points two rebounds and assists. Uh, no, my apologies, 19 points, four rebounds, and three assists. Yep. And him and Derek are playing, I think, very well off of one another. Derek doesn't seem to be rushing anything. He came yeah. into this game scoring the ball at a very high clip, but he doesn't seem like he needs to approach every night feeling as though he has to force it, force the issue, exactly. and put up a certain amount of points. Um, so as long as everybody is comfortable sharing the game, anybody can go off on any given night. And then yeah, Cliff Moore, seventeen I, uh, points, eight rebounds. Yeah, do, I mean, like for Derek and, and Noah, I just love the way they complement each other as guards. I mean, they both can create, they both can score, and they're both unselfish. I thought the the coolest thing I saw, I saw a quote today from Noah where he got the turnover, and it was from Jerry Carino's article. Shout out Jerry, got the turnover, sprinted ninety four feet back. And then blocked it on the other end. And, and when they asked him about it afterwards, he said, well, if I get a turnover and put my head down, then J. Mike thinks it's OK and Derek thinks that's OK. And like, I think that's the leadership that they're really going to need moving forward. Like, I think the the thing that we saw early on and me and you kind of talked about it a little bit was who is the leader of this team? And, and, and like, you know, where does that leadership come from? And it's hard being a new guy because Noah is, is technically a veteran. He's a veteran, but he's. It's his first year in the Big Ten. It's his first year at Rutgers. Exactly. Sure. So it, it's tough to come in and kind of just take that role. But the way you overcome that is is actions and like by doing it. So he gets that turnover instead of putting his head down. He sprints back and gets a block. I mean, he let's be real. He's not the most athletic dude. He's not the fastest dude, especially between him, Derek, and J. Mike. So if they see that, now they're going to be able to do that more often than, than probably he is. Uh, you know, and that that kind of sparks that up where he's showing the young guys what you're supposed to do when you make a mistake or when you get a turnover uh, or make a bad play, whatever it is. Um, you know, so I think that's going to be one of the biggest contributions that he brings moving forward too. is just that leadership and, and helping these young guys grow faster. Yeah, leading by example. Um, fifth year, who's been at 
a few other programs. This is not anything new to him. Um, and up from your area, man, they they producing these tough little yeah, England, these tough man, little yeah. guards up there. I remember, I remember Noah, shit. like from way back when he was in like eighth grade. I remember, I remember. <laughs> he was popping his shit too, which I I, I really yeah. like. Um, yeah. St. Peter's will definitely try to punk you if you allow them to. And he said, nah, none of that. And yeah. he made really big shots. He locked up um, against their best player uh, who came into this game with a lot of hype and Latrell Reed. He finished with a donut, man, which yeah, was wild. Yeah, over 10, I think, right? Over 10. Yeah, right? so they threw multiple bodies at him. Um, so it was good. It was a nice um, team-oriented approach, and I was I was uh, curious to see how they would come out after such extended time off and Me too. That's so always start offensively. Yeah, and it's tough because like, you know after – uh, a couple of days of being in game shape, you're out of game shape. Yeah, so 100%. you you yeah. come back in that first practice and it's like you never played basketball before. Yeah. And then <laughs> that first game is a killer. And then you get into the second half. This team has definitely been able to turn it on and take it to another another level after halftime. So um, all good things to build on. Um, they notched 13 assists on 21 buckets and only seven turnovers, which those are really favorable numbers showing that they're, sh- they're sharing the game. Um, and they're looking to make the, the best pass and get the greatest shot per possession. And holding that team that likes to be ultra aggressive and attack gaps and get into the paint to only 23% shooting, you know, you got to really tip your hat to not only your on the ball defense, but also being in the right spots from a help side standpoint. Um, but 20, 25 offensive rebounds um, for St. Peter's. And that's a really good segment uh, heading. Now, Into man. the big show, man. Big Ten play yeah, is play. upon us, man. Ooh, and okay. Coach Underwood and Coleman Hawkins and Terrence Shannon Jr. and Sincere. You know, they're coming in and they're trying to start off on the right the right foot. Have you had a chance to check out the Illini? You know what? I actually have not seen them yet this year, which uh, is, is kind of upsetting because I know they're a good team. I know they lost to um, – they played Marquette really well. Um, and I saw the highlight to that game. And the the thing that stands out to me so far is that Coleman Hawkins hasn't even really hit his stride yet. I mean, we know who he is as a player. I think he's only averaging like four points right now. Uh, Terrence Chandler Jr., obviously a dude, you know, a really good basketball player and then really well coached team. I mean, they, they've been around for a little bit. They were kind of in a similar situation as us when, when I first got to Rutgers and how they built it up. Um, you know, Coach Underwood does a great job, and sometimes his coaching methods get questioned a little bit, but I, I love the way he coaches. I do. I, I think I, I love the way he gets on his guys and he holds guys accountable. I mean, that's how you get better, and, and they've shown that for sure. Um, but I'm excited. To, I'm just excited to be in the building, number one. Um, I got five tickets for for the game, so I'm excited to be there. I'm bringing my girl, her mom, I'm bringing uh, – one of my friends, and then I'm bringing one of the kids that I actually trained for basketball training. So I'm excited to That's bring good. them into the building and just show them, you know, how Jersey, how loud Jersey mice gets, especially in, in league play. So I'm excited for that. And um, I'm excited to see how they look against a, you know, a really good basketball team. I mean, they're ranked 24th for a reason. That's a good, that's a good team that they're going up against. And we're talking about the offensive rebounds. And, you know, I just think once you get to big 10 play, you really start to see what, what a team is really about. I mean, is night in and night out, you're playing against really good competition. So this is where it gets like fun as a competitor, where it gets exciting. Yeah, I think you hit a lot of key points. Um, and the DNA is always going to start for the fight night line eye with that head coach and those players that have been in the system now. Uh, Terrence Shannon Jr., uh, he's already uh, killing uh, this season, averaging 19 and a half. And yeah. then, a lot of return players that are going into either their second or third year, or maybe, you know, they're just really getting more familiarized with the Big Ten play. All in all, Dane Danger and Luke Goody um, are, you know, playing well, uh, respectively, too. Danger yep. at 10.3, uh, averaging five, and Luke Good, Goody uh, uh, averaging 8.8 as well. Um, it'll be a really good test uh, for Cliff Amori to match up against uh, Dane Danger this early in the season. Um they're going to need him and him to establish and, and to be able to be a consistent low, you know, low post scoring threat to be able to spread that floor. Uh, so Rutgers continue to share the game as well. Yeah, man, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I think this is this again, those, as a competitor, like this is the type of game that Cliff is going to look forward to. Dane Deja is a very good basketball player. He's tricky. You know, he, he's not the most athletic, but 
he can get you in some foul trouble if, if you start to get a cliff to jump a little bit, you know. So it's going to be different challenges that Rutgers hasn't really seen yet. Um, you know, I'm interested to see how Noah, Derek, and J. Mike handle some taller guards, bigger players, um, you know, how they defend. Uh, I'm interested to see how Gavin Griffiths rises to the occasion. I'm, You know, there's so many different things that um, – that you don't see in these non-conference games that, you know, just start to come to life in, in, in Big Ten play where, you know, you get to see who who the real competitors are, who, you know, who gets to step up when, when the spotlight's at, at its brightest. So I'm, I'm excited to see it. Um, and yesterday's pregame before we called the, the game, um, Coach Pico talked about the decision uh, to bring Gavin off the bench to be an offensive spark. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that that is crucial for yeah. – uh, it's a, it's a it's a much different mentality coming out and expected to start as opposed to coming in and having a chance to analyze the game yep. uh, before you're actually injected into it and then figuring out how you can make an impact. He had six and and four yesterday. What do you think about that decision? And I was talking to Jerry about this. The difference for a freshman that first portion of the season when you get those non conferences below your belt and then it's time for conference play. Do you treat it as season number two? I don't know if I would. I don't know. As a freshman, maybe not, honestly, mm-hmm. just because you really don't know any better. You really don't know any better. I think I started to treat it as a different season my next years, my next years as I continue to, you know, just see the difference and uh, and understand the competition that we were going up against. But I think that for him, it definitely is. It's it's a good thing for him to see how the game is flowing, how guys are playing defense, the energy. I mean, especially for against a team like Illinois. Um it's tough as a freshman to to know how hard you need to play on defense. Like, and and that may sound weird, you know, to a fan because you're like, oh no, you should definitely be playing hard. There's you can't make like a, a tiny mistake. If you make a, mm-hmm. a one simple mistake, it's a it's a three point basket, and that's the difference between winning and losing, winning by three or or going to over or losing by three or going to overtime. You think you're or, overexerting yourself and trying to put out maximum effort every single time down the court, which is yep. a very difficult thing that you have to train your body to get normal and used 100%. to. And and I, the other thing too, I think that he does maybe without him even knowing it, he, there is a little bit of pressure on him as as a freshman. Everyone was talking about five star, and you know, there's been. NBA talk, you know, around his name. And, and when you're coming off the bench, all that pressure kind of relaxes a little mm-hmm. bit where it's like, you know, no, nah, I'm just I'm just the guy coming off the bench. And when I when I'm open, I shoot it. And when I'm not, I don't, <laughs> you know, it, it makes it a lot easier. I remember my best my best games as a freshman were um, in Big Ten play were were at the Big Ten tournament where I actually came off the bench. Uh, you know, that was that those are my best games where I felt like OK, I'm not starting if, like, if, if if we're down when I get in, it's not my fault. And and how can I just be a little spark plug and help the team? And and like you said, I, I got to watch the game and analyze the stuff that Corey Sanders was doing in the pick and roll or how they were, they were defending or who was playing well, who was shooting, you know, and different stuff like that. And then I could come in and, and it's almost subconscious, too. You're really not thinking like that. But now you come into the game and, and you're able to, to flow the way you want to and, and, and you get to see how everyone else was playing. So I think. Gavin has that type of mindset too, where he'll be able to watch and, and see, you know, the weak points in the defense or what's going well and what's not, and then he'll be able to react to it. Learning via osmosis is a very powerful thing, especially in athletics, man, because a lot of folks are just visual learners too. Yeah. Um, and then you can go out and execute at the drop of a dime. And and I saw him making strides yesterday, two steals, which yeah. were scheme and scouting report, right position, yeah. right decision. At the at the most opportunistic uh, point in time for him to utilize that length and get in the passing lanes, and he started to break a couple of you know open court misses. But I think that's just like the first game back, you know, yeah. eye, wrinkles that you got to iron out, getting back into the flow of, of flying up and down the court. But it's coming along for him, and I I anticipate that uh, he'll have some more offensive explosions because he has a bag, yo, and he can he score in so yeah. many different ways. Uh, he has a he, bag, man. And that's another great point, though, too, scouting report. I didn't, I didn't even mention that. I think that's another thing, too, because you when you start, sometimes you're so hyped up in the game, you kind of forget the scouting report for a second. But when You, you just go the out there and run it around crazy. The scouting, report, <laughs> and the scouting report is crazy, though. They will tell you, like, look, when he drives left, he's going to take two. Like, okay, for me, for example. There's going to be two dribbles, and then he was going to step back. If I go right, it was going to be a drive to the basket. So when you're on the bench and you see – you actually see the scouting report happen. Like when he comes off this screen right here, it's going up. And then 
it will literally happen to the starters. They will come off the screen and it goes up, and then you're on the bench seeing like, oh shit, that was straight from the scout. And then you all I had to do was listen. Yeah, all, all you I had, had to do was listen. And then you start, <laughs> then you start to remember it. So I think, I think that's another great part about coming off the bench too, because when you start, you're not really. You just excited for the game. You kind of forget about all the scouting report stuff for a second until that first time out, and then you get reminded, like, "Oh shit, yeah, this is this is literally the scout." I just got to remember to do this or do that. Yeah, uh, I can't agree more. I think that you hit on some really good points. And before I get a little bit uh, further into Illinois, Cliff Amore averaging uh, almost twelve and nine. Damn, a damn near a double double. Yep. Um, do you think that that is? where you would like to see him stay at the end of the year? Does he have to take it up to another level uh, for this team to make some noise and finish in the upper echelon in the Big Ten? I think I think he could, I think think he he can take it up to another level. Um, he's definitely capable. And I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I think it'll start with the guard play. It'll yep. start with the guard play. You know, Couldn't agree it, more. If Derek and Noah are getting downhill and, and J. Mike, if they're getting downhill, if they're attacking – they're making shots. It just makes everything so much easier for Cliff. He doesn't have to work as hard for post ups. Um, you know, maybe he gets the ball in different positions where it's just a dump off and he's just he's just dunking the basketball. Um, there's going to be ways to get him more looks by them stepping their game up. So I think that's that's going to be the biggest thing for me. And uh, and I mean, if if it's easier for him on offense. You're going to get more rebounds from him on defense. You're going to get more block shots from him on defense. He's going to play more. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's all these different things that if they can if they can make his life easier, then he steps his game up. So I think it's, it's going to be a team effort, honestly. Um, but I definitely think he's capable of more. He definitely thinks he's capable of more. And, and I saw him all summer, man. I mean, he was working, you know. So I think he hasn't even really shown uh, everything that he has yet and and – you know, Saturday's gonna be the perfect time to show it for sure. You gotta put the you gotta put the coin in the machine. If you if yeah. you if you understand like from a, a big man perspective, bigs aren't gonna go out there and keep setting screens for you if you're not rewarding them. Right. And and bigs are not gonna go out and run the floor as hard as they can unless they're being reciprocated um in some capacity. And guards are able to put the coin in the machine, so to speak, by finding them on dribble drive situations when the defense is converging and throwing it up to the rim. So Cliff can hang on rims. That's what he likes to do. And yeah. in years past, he's had the benefit of playing with you and Paul Mulcahy. And Noah did a really good job yesterday. Dave, uh, Jamichael Davis had four assists. Um, Wolfwalk has been sharing the game. Uh, and he hit the three, though. He, he hit, hit the, the tray yesterday. Yeah, that was I saw him shoot one in practice. I was like, wait, I had to, I had to text the call. I'm like, he does that now? <laughs> like, yeah, every now and then. Like, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that one coming. That was yeah, yeah. I'm happy for him. He talked about the work too. He's been putting that work in too. So for sure, I mean, it's, it's, it's paying good. dividend. It's nice to see it when it uh, when it what happens in the dark comes to light. So uh, yeah. a lot of nice glimpses from different pieces of the team, and all in all, a very good collective win. Uh, putting St. Peter's behind us just a little bit more about Illinois five and no, five and one this season. But I wouldn't really consider a lot of their resume up until this point anything to really harp on, no signature win. So we're still, I think, the verdict's still out, and this will be a really good first test for both schools yeah, to cool. see where they are from a competition standpoint. Yeah. Um, and when you look at recent history, the Eli and I have not had an easy time. Yo, um, I, I didn't even realize that. I saw that stat I saw that stat this morning. I didn't, I didn't realize that they, they're – one in, what is it? One in four? One in four at Rutgers? At Jersey uh, Mike's Arena, which is like the norm for most people rolling yeah. in Jersey Mike's Arena. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, but I didn't even, I didn't, because I always, I always hated playing against Illinois. I felt, but I, now that I'm thinking about it, it was always whenever we went there where it was, you know, really tough. And then they would come to our place and it'd be the same deal, you know, just, out, you know, opposite. So I think, I think that that's a, it's a funny stat because I just, in my head, the way I remember, I'm like, man, I, I didn't, I didn't want to play against Illinois. They always, they always felt, felt like they always had us figured out. Yeah, I get that. It's a definitely a game of styles and matchups, and and the scouting. Some coaches just really have your number, um, have yeah. it down. Um, in regards to a lot of the noise in the media, uh, the Big Ten waning, in, in regards to just the overall respect factor for the conference, people saying it's another down year. I feel like this is maybe like two to three years consecutively where it's just been low expectations for the conference once it comes to postseason play, despite having the number one team in the country yep. and the reigning Big Ten 
Player of the Year and National Player of the Year. Is this the year that the Big Ten changes the narrative? And I think that the only way that the narrative has changed is with a national championship. That's the only way it's going to be changed. And I don't I don't necessarily agree with the narrative. Um, anyone who has played basketball, anyone who has played in March Madness understands that it is called March Madness for a reason. I mean, it is truly madness. Um, when you think about the turnaround time to scout for a new opponent, someone that you've never seen before, uh, play style completely different than what you're used to. And then you take into account that it is literally just one game. It is one game. It is not like the NBA where it's a four, it's, it's a seven game series, you know, first to four wins it, you know, there's, there's no do overs, you know, you know, so to speak, it's either you play well or you don't and, and it, or, or you don't play well and you try to still find a way to make sure that they don't play well and, and find a way to win, uh, through your defense. You know, so I think it's really about who gets hot at the right time. It's not about who who the best team is, uh, but that's what makes March Madness so fun and special. So I love the way it's set up, but it does it does hurt the narrative talks, in my opinion, just because you don't really you don't get to see who truly is the best team. Um, but just like how you just said, the narrative is what it is. People are hating on the Big Ten. They do need a national championship to kind of silence all of that, and I think. You know, right now, Purdue looks like they got a really good chance, man. I mean, they 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 took down a, a good Marquette team. Um, Marquette is tough. They're tough. I mean, they're mm-hmm. tough. Tyler Kolek, shout out Tyler Kolek. He's from around my way, too. He, he uh, started his career at George Mason. He's a, he's a really good basketball player, man, and, and he's got Marquette looking really good, too. But, you know, Purdue found a way to to, to take them down, and I think this is going to be the year. And it kind of – it's it reminds me of, uh, the, of Virginia – when when they mm-hmm. lost in the first round, they come back the next year and get the national championship. So, um, you know, I think I think that there's definitely opportunities for the Big Ten this year. I think there's some good teams, but like you said, the narrative is what it is, and and that's probably what they're gonna have to do just to silence all the haters. Even though I don't really agree with it. Yeah, for Purdue, I mean, uh, the pressure is is insurmountable this year. It's chip or bust. But yep. um, I think that there is also a lot of parity throughout the conference and people who will, will pop up and surprise some folks as the year progresses. Um, doing a comparative analysis of some of the other uh, big uh, Power Five conferences out there, um, a lot of people have the SEC number one right now mm-hmm. with Mississippi State being 6-0 and leading yeah. that conference. This is this is like just strictly off of like memory, history, and and obviously I seen I saw Kansas earlier this year. I mean, I would, I would put Big 12 number one uh, just the way that they – They've handled themselves in the postseason in, in, in past years and, and um, you know, the schemes and, and just the teams in general. I mean, talk about teams like Kansas, Baylor, Kansas State. I mean, that's always uh, good basketball being played. Um, SEC, always love their guard play. And, um, you know, and like you said, if we're talking March Madness and, and how that's going to go out, I, I think that you have to you have to have the SEC up in the in the in the top half um of power five just because of the way their guards play and how they get up and down big 10 for me i think would be third uh after that i guess you could go acc pac 12 is kind of falling apart right now i don't don't know how we can how we can uh list them (laughs) and then and then um i mean you i I feel you got to include the big east too even though they're not they're not technically power five but big east obviously got some good teams as well with marquette uconn um they're gonna they're gonna be up there for sure yeah, I uh, I definitely agree in regards to the cream of the crop, and I think the the most well balanced team being in the Big Twelve and some transfer impact joining, uh, obviously the riches that were already um, and at Kansas, uh, yeah. and it's hard to bet against them. Um, so we'll see how everything shakes out, and I think that we'll start to be able to tell over the next couple of weeks as conference play really oh. ratchets up. <laughs> that's when the the natural selection will start to take place. Yeah. <laughs> then yeah. We'll have a different episode about, you know, what the realistic viewpoint is based off of the first couple of contests and how people are reacting to the higher level of competition. Most definitely, bro. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, it's, it's, it's early, man. It's only it's not even December yet. So, you know, we got we got some time to, to, to sit back and watch some good basketball and see how it all unfolds. So it's, it's going to be a long season. 
Love it, man. And then uh, with us pivoting out from Thanksgiving and 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 Halloween is now in the rears, man. And you know, as soon as uh, it turns uh, the day after Thanksgiving, you start hearing Mariah Carey everywhere, and it's Christmas Christmas time everywhere. What are your your holiday wish list? If you had maybe two to three things that you would like to see from Rutgers going ahead, um, as we conclude this episode. Going ahead, man. I mean, I want to. I want to see them <clears throat> get a good road win. I think that's going to be something that Rutgers has struggled with a lot. <laughs> Rutgers has struggled with a lot. Uh, I was part of it. I, you know, we saw it. You know, last year too. And you know, just seeing them get a good road win, I think, uh, will be really impressive and as something that I'm definitely wishing for early. Um, just continued sharing of the basketball guards being aggressive but not selfish you know i think there, there's always a, a misunderstanding there of when you tell a guy to be aggressive you automatically think score 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 i think them being aggressive is going to open everything up for the rest of the team can they continue that in big 10 play where the scout changes a little bit defense is a little bit better guys are bigger more physical um so that's definitely on my wish list and i ain't gonna lie when you first said the word wish list i started thinking of gifts that i want I've been looking at these UGG slippers, man, that <laughs> I was hating on for a long, long ass time about UGG slippers. I tried my boys UGG slippers on. Them, them shits are fire, bro. They're, they're mad comfy. So if my girlfriend's listening right now, UGG slippers for sure. Uh, that's definitely on my wish list. But let's get what about you, these bro? Uggs, let, me, let, let me let me hear let me hear your wish list for Rutgers. First off, as you get older, you quickly realize comfort over style. Yo, comfort them. And when you can combine the two, though. it's a win win. And no, Uggs definitely is a is a ergonomically is the perfect thing that you could put on your feet, especially after you work out. Things yeah, is definitely. super comfy. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, I agree with a lot of the points that you were mentioning in re- in regards to a road win. I think that's a true test, especially considering the only neutral game game this year or a road game down in Trenton against Princeton. Rutgers lost. So, yeah. is this team? Um, able to go out and snuff out a few, um, you know, behind enemy lines. They got a couple opportunities coming up. Uh, Wake Forest, December 6th, and Winston-Salem um, is going to be, they're going to try to get back at Rutgers for, you know, a loss in recent history as well. Yeah. And then you got the Battle of New Jersey, uh, Seton Hall, uh, and the Garden State Hardwood Classic up at the Prudential Center, which is going to be World War Three, as you know it always is. A lot of fireworks and theatrics in that game. Um, just healthiness. I want to see Mwap Mag back. Um, you know, I want to see Emmanuel back and, uh, you know, people to be able to remain healthy and get a full season. You know, at this point, obviously not a full season for Mwap, but a full season of Big Ten play. Uh, he'll be a huge uh, game changer. And then, you know, just Cliff taking his game to another level. I think that he has another gear or two or three um, to really be able to showcase his talent and dominate. Uh, in the Big Ten to prove, you know, that he truly is in that number one, number two conversation as best centers in the entire league. So that's my wish list. That's a good wish list, bro. Okay. And then I need a pair of them Uggs, man. So if you can slide me a size 15. Yo, I need those Uggs, (laughs) man. I need those Uggs. That's a good wish list, though. I think think, uh, hopefully they all come true. Yeah, yeah. We'll see you on the next episode. We'll be sure to keep ourselves honest, uh, check back in, and um, and see how RU is progressing as this Big Ten season, a Big Ten conference play is now on our doorstep. Uh, you know, the intensity is going to ratchet up and, you know, so will our approaches and our takes on each episode of the Are You Listening podcast. Appreciate you tuning in. G, I'll get up with you next time. Yes, sir.